Um, and we are going to change up uh, the topics a little bit. We're going to start talking about the neurovascular emergencies. As Peter said in the beginning, we're trying to add a lot more of these into the heart course because they're super important. And we are going to talk about thunderclap, thunderclap headaches. And for this talk, and you should be able to now have the handout, everything is in the handout, there are three things that we're going to talk about today in the thunderclap headache realm. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, the deadly, really bad aneurysm bursting. We're also going to talk about RCVS, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, good. I see five, six hands. Awesome. Has anybody seen it clinically? Great. And this is something that I've seen now three times in my life. It's pretty rare, but I really want you guys to have it in the back of your head um, because it is something that we see, and it's almost as common, believe it or not, as subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm. So we're going to talk about this. And then cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. How many people have seen one of these? Okay, great. So a little more. And this is something that most of us were taught in our training. Um, I think of it as a DVT of the brain. Okay? So I'm going to tell you all the things you need to remember. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you do a CT within six hours, you can rule it out. RCVS is recurrent thunderclap headaches, okay? I will talk much more about this, but just to get out of the gates, RCVS is recurrent thunderclap headaches. And then CVST, cerebral sinus, venous sinus thrombosis, is a DVT of the brain. You can go to sleep now, but I recommend not because we're going to talk about those things again. But those are the things that I want you to know. So first off, what is a thunderclap headache? This whole talk is about thunderclap headache. So listen up. Thanks, guys. Nicely done. It was supposed to be kind of dramatic. So thunderclap, right? So the thunderclap should wake us all up in addition to our sugar and caffeine. But that's a thunderclap, right? So somebody back in the day diagnosed thunderclap headache as this. What does that mean? What is a thunderclap headache? Sudden and onset. Absolutely. And this is something to remind us all that the history Remember how Amal talked, the history is super important for headaches. You see tons of headaches, a sea of headaches in the emergency department. And when I'm taking a history on the headache, especially if someone has a language barrier, I say, was it sudden and onset, like a thunderclap? And a lot of people don't know thunderclaps, so I say, was it sudden and onset, or was it gradual? Because most of the time, migraine is going to be what? Migraine, tension headaches they're going to be gradual, right? And I will literally show that with my hand because I want to determine, was this a thunderclap headache? And most patients will say to you, they'll say, I was at the grocery store grabbing the jelly when it happened. Or I was reading my book on page 273. Maybe not that specific, but they will be specific about what happened when they got the headache. That is how you differentiate between a thunderclap headache and all the other headaches that we see. That is the most important historical piece. Was it sudden and onset or was it gradual? Okay. And what do you think in terms of minutes a thunderclap headache represents? The headache went to maximal intensity in X minutes. What do you guys think? It should be like a minute, right? Two minutes, three minutes? Well, the studies actually use an hour which seems like a long time for a thunderclap headache, but the historical piece is where I want you to focus on. Was it sudden and onset? Do you know exactly what you were doing when it happened, or was it gradual? Okay? So this whole talk is about those sudden and onset thunderclap headaches, and we're going to do those three things. So like I said, there's a sea of headaches. You see tons of headaches in the ED. Most of them are migraine or tension headache, and then thunderclap headache is a subset of that. 10% of thunderclap headaches are the deadly subarachnoid. You gotta know about that, and everybody does know about that. Then 8% of those thunderclap headaches are gonna be RCVS, this thing that I never learned in med school, I never learned in residency, I only learned in the last five, 10 years. And then there's cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Nobody knows what percentage they are, because they can be thunderclap, they can be gradual, but they're rarer than subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we're gonna talk about those three things. So first, subarachnoid. So subarachnoid hemorrhage actually comes in two types. There's a bad, lots of blood, and there's a not as bad. They're both bleeding in the subarachnoid space, 
Most subarachnoid hemorrhages are this one. They're caused by an aneurysm, 90%. But 10% of subarachnoid hemorrhage is actually venous bleeding. It's considered non-aneurysmal. So aneurysmal is aneurysm, arterial, high-velocity bleeding. Bad, very deadly. Then there is this non-aneurysmal 10%. But you're going to treat them the same. You're going to admit them and get neurosurgery, okay? So just know that there are two types. The aneurysmal is what we all worry about. This is the kind that can kill you very, very swiftly. I love this picture because usually in those aneurysmal types, you have an aneurysm, and then it bursts, and it spews all this blood into the subarachnoid space, just like you see here, spewing, spewing blood. But the blood is not the only problem. You'll see here, it goes and touches the arteries and it causes vasospasm. So after they get admitted, they also have a lot of problems with vasospasm. So this is a real big deal. These perimesencephalic venous bleeding causes less blood, but it can similarly cause very severe headache. So when I was in training in medical school and residency, the sentence was, if you think about subarachnoid hemorrhage, it is a CT followed by an LP. There's no stopping. You have to do both unless the CT is positive. And that was good for training because I did a lot of LPs and learned how to do LPs, but it wasn't as awesome for the patients, right? There's post-LP headaches. It takes time. And so people have started to think, and this is probably the biggest development in subarachnoid hemorrhage in the last 10 years, is what I told you in the beginning you don't always have to do the LP anymore, which is really beneficial for a lot of reasons. And this is the pathophysiology behind that. So say right now I have thunderclap headache, I started having bleeding in my brain, the blood would look white and bright, right? So acute blood is bright on CT. Over time, that acute blood gets less and less bright. And over time, right now, if I had a subarachnoid and you took some of my CSF, it would be clear. It wouldn't actually be yellow yet because it takes time for xanthrochromia, which is the yellowish discoloration in the LP, to develop. So that's why we always did both, because you don't know where you are on the inflection point. So this is an example. This is a subdural, but you see here, acute blood on this side is going to be bright. Subacute blood becomes more isodense. And then in the last one, chronic subdural, the blood's still there. It just doesn't show up as bright. So that's why, over time, the CT is not as sensitive to pick up that bleeding. Here's an example of xanthrochromia. Here you can see it's this yellowish discoloration in the CSF, but it doesn't happen right away. And the problem, again, with LPs, right? They take time. 15 to 20% of the time, the patient will get a post-LP headache, which is really unfortunate. And then there's this whole, I got blood on my tap, was that from the actual tap itself, from the trauma, or was it from an aneurysm? And the only way to really tell is to do further testing, like CT angiograms, formal angiograms. And so there ends up becoming a large workup. So LPs are not awesome for this diagnosis either. So people started thinking about 10 years ago, is there some other way? Is there a decision rule? Is there a CTA? Can I just do that? Can I do an MRI? Can I just do the CT? So if you want to remember one person to look up and Google or PubMed, who's done a lot of research in this area, it's not Katy Perry or Platypus the Perry, but it's this other guy, uh, Jeffrey Perry, who's from Canada, my Canadians, from Ottawa. Um, they do a lot of research, really high quality research on this subject, and he's done a bunch of papers. Um, the two things I'm going to talk to you about are the decision rule and then the six hour rule. Those are the two most important things in the last 10 years for subarachnoid. So comes from Ottawa, where the Ottawa ankle rules come from. They're really good at following rules in Ottawa, I guess. Um, so the Ottawa rule for subarachnoid is all of these things. It's like the PERC rule. And you can MD calc this as well, you guys. You can go into MD calc. If a patient comes in with a headache, you can answer all these questions. Are they um, age? greater than, so if they have any of these, they fail, okay? If they're over 40, they fail. If they have neck pain or stiffness with their headache, they fail. If they had witness loss of consciousness, they fail. If they had onset during exertion, if it is a thunderclap headache, which is this whole talk, and then if they have limited neck flexion, so if they can't flex their neck like this. If any of those are positive, 
you have to work them up for subarachnoid. But if all of them are negative, like the PERC rule, you don't have to. You don't have to do a CT, you don't have to do an LP. And it's 100% sensitive, and it's been externally validated. So this rule is solid. The problem, I think, when you're doing this rule clinically is that most people that you're worried about subarachnoid are going to fail the rule, right? Because they're going to have a, a thunderclap headache. But I do think it's really good for training um, to learn about the things that you want to ask about in your history, right? And of these six things, does anybody know which is the most sensitive? I'll show you. It's neck pain or stiffness. And when I think about this, think about, again, aneurysm spews blood into the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is tight. It doesn't like that there, just like meningitis, right? It doesn't like having something in its space. And so it causes meningismus, okay? So another thing to remember in your history, sudden onset, neck pain or stiffness, meningismus. Think very cautiously about subarachnoid, okay? So you have that rule at your disposal. And then the next question was, well, what about CT angiograms? A lot of us have CT angiograms now. How many people can get one in the middle of the night? Yeah, like most all of us can do that now, um, which wasn't the case um, back when I was training. So now we have this. Is this something that can replace doing the LP? Well, the problem here is that what does a CT angiogram look for? It's a CT with contrast in the arteries, and it looks for aneurysms, okay? It doesn't look for blood in the subarachnoid space. It looks for aneurysms, and it's pretty good at looking for aneurysms. The problem is, is let's say I had my thunderclap headache right now. I got my CT scan, it was negative for blood. I get a CTA, and it shows an aneurysm that's three millimeters, but there's no blood. So am I just one of those two to three percent of people who has an aneurysm that's never gonna rupture? Or did it actually cause a problem? You don't know. So then I get admitted. I have neurosurgery. I get some coiling. And I may have a complication or a stroke from the coiling. And so that is the problem. There's this kind of snowball effect. And so really smart experts um, in emergency neurology really still recommend doing the CT. If it's within six hours, it's negative, you're good. If it's not, do the LP and look for blood. Now, have I ever gotten a CTA to look for an aneurysm? Absolutely. If somebody says, I have a thunderclap headache, and my dad had an aneurysm, and my grandmother had an aneurysm, and my dog has an aneurysm, they're worried about an aneurysm. I'm going to do a CTA, because it is very good for looking at aneurysms. So I'm not telling you not to do it. Just understand what the test is giving you. Does that make sense? Because um, 2 to 3% of us, so some of us in this room, have asymptomatic aneurysms that will never cause any problems, okay? So you can totally use it, just know what you're using it for, okay? Um, and then what about just the CT? So this is that huge, big development. Dr. Perry from Ottawa did a really big study to look at this. And remember, we talked about these inflection points. So it turns out that the inflection point is about six hours where modern-day CT scanners can identify subarachnoid hemorrhage with very, 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 very good sensitivity. So this is a landmark paper. It's in your handout. This was from 2011, and most of us have probably heard about this by now. But essentially, they had a lot of people with thunderclap headache. A lot of people had subarachnoid, and it was 100% sensitive. 100%. Is anything 100% in medicine, in life? No. Um, so there was a, uh, lots of papers came out after this. This is too good to be true. What's really the deal? Can we really use this? And there was a lot of controversy for the first five years after this came out. And then this paper from 2016 came out, which really probably is more accurate at the real world incidence of subarachnoid because nothing's 100. But basically what they saw here is that in patients with thunderclap headache, normal neuro exam, normal brain CT read by an attending radiologist, so it has to be an attending, within six hours, it is extremely sensitive. And the number that you can feel confident giving your patients is about one to two in a thousand. So that's really low, right? Yes, question. That's a really great question. So the question was, any comment on the size of the bleed or repeating the CT? I probably wouldn't repeat the CT itself without contrast, because remember, as time goes on, the blood gets less and less bright. 
In these patients, I don't know all of the specifics, um, but some of them had like um, the perimesencephalic bleed, for example, the one that I said that wasn't that bad, that's the venous bleeding. You could see a little bit of blood there. But the bottom line is a CT scan, modern day, in an awake, normal neuro exam patient is very, very, very sensitive. It's not 100%, but it's very sensitive. This is better than the PERC rule, right? 2%, yes. So this is what they call modern day. So it's all, I believe, 64 and above and attending radiologist. So it has to be a night hawk or some kind of attending. It can't be a resident. And most of us have those CTs now, right? So the CTs have gotten better. We're really more scrutinizing. If someone has a headache, if any of you have a bad headache, go to the ED right away, right? Because you don't want to have the LP done. So get there within six hours and have this done. Um, and the thing with this is if you talk to your patients and you say, you had the thunderclap headache, you came in with three within three hours, that was great, we did the CT scan, it didn't show any blood. It's not 100%, but it's pretty darn good. I can do this LP and really look for blood, or we can take the risk of one to two per thousand. And what do you think most patients are gonna choose? Yeah, take the risk, right? Um, so just know that you can do shared decision making, but I personally feel really good about this six hour rule, that's what people call it these days, um, because in the end, remember, doing the LP has a lot of false positives, and it has a lot of pain and workup and post-LP headaches, and so that's not a great alternative either. So use your own judgment, but for most people, they would say, if you're worried about subarachnoid, you can do the decision rule. If they're positive, do the CT. If it's within six hours, you're good, and it's negative. If it's greater than six hours, if it's 12 hours since the headache started, you gotta do the LP or something else. And you could choose a CTA if you're really worried about aneurysm. Everybody get that? Yeah, question. Exactly, yes. This is all commerce with, with thunderclap headache. Yeah. So sentinel bleed was the question. So sentinel bleed is when the aneurysm bursts and it bleeds a little bit and then it forms a clot. That just might be the tip of the iceberg where six hours later then it's going to bleed again. That's all commerce. So everybody, they followed up really well in that second study um, for months. So MRI is becoming more available. Not all of us have this 24-7, but it is becoming more available. And some people have said, well, what about MRI? There's no radiation. It's more available. And MRI can pick up bleeding. So let me show you an example here. This patient had a subarachnoid bleed. This is five days out. You don't see it there, right? Because remember, blood becomes more isodense over time. You do see it here on the MRI. Now, this is five days out. And I'll tell you a case that I had. It was a patient who um, was on oral contraceptives, and she had a thunderclap headache during intercourse, and she came in a few days later still having this headache. And we did the CT. It was negative. And we actually thought, well, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. She's on OCPs, right? So we did an MRI, MRV and we saw subarachnoid blood. So if you have availability with MRI, it may show you something a few days later, but there's not good evidence yet to really rely on that, okay? I just wanna let you know that it's out there, people are talking about it. If you're getting an MRI for another reason, you might see blood, but don't use it specifically for subarachnoid yet. Fair? Okay, so this is an example of a diagnostic pathway for headache that you can use. Um, this is from, I got this from the EMRAP website, it's from Minnesota, a doctor named Cameron Berg does a lot of diagnostic pathways. And you'll see here, a lot of the experts say, if you do the rule and you fail the rule, then you gotta do a head CT. If the head CT is negative within six hours, then you're good. If the head CT is negative and it's greater than six hours, you still gotta do the LP, okay? Question? Absolutely. So the question was, rule number one was age over 40. Absolutely. If they are over 40, they fail that rule. So again, you're bringing up the point that most people that you're seeing are going to fail that rule. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Again, so the question was, what if they're feeling better? You give them some droperidol, if you have that, or you give them Reglan, Compsine, whatever. Um, you still have that risk right? 
just like the sentinel bleed that the other gentleman brought up. But if the patient feels well and you tell them, it's a one to two in a thousand risk, are you okay with that? And they say, yes, yeah, shared decision making, that's the right. All right, let's move on. If everybody's okay, I'll stay and we can talk more um, afterwards. We're gonna do treatment on subarachnoid and then we're gonna cover those other two topics. So the treatment, so let's say they do have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The bottom line here, guys, is blood pressure control, blood pressure control. Remember the spewing of the blood, right? You don't want the blood pressure to be 200 because it will spew more. So most of the experts say you want to target less than 160 systolic. And the agents that you want to use are going to be nicardipine first. If you have access to nicardipine, that helps mostly with the vasospasm and the blood pressure. Labetalol is also a good choice if their heart rate is not too low. Um, these are both titratable. So if you're transferring, because everybody with the subarachnoid has to go to a place where there's neurosurgery, right? If you're transferring, I would personally start with nicardipine if you can. Titrate to a blood pressure below 160. If they're on anticoagulation, you have to get them reversed. Recommendations are for vitamin K, if it's a vitamin K dependent um, warfarin. And then four factor PCC. I know not everybody has that yet, but if you do, that is preferable to FFP, okay? And then all of them need neurosurgery and ICU. Okay, so now we're feeling really good about subarachnoid hemorrhage. Remember those two other things we gotta talk about in the last eight minutes. So, this is a great paper. Remember I said Jeff Perry is the guy to Google for subarachnoid. This gentleman, Jonathan Edlow, I just recently worked on a um, chapter with him, he is a emergency medicine physician with great expertise in neurovascular emergencies. So stroke, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, he's really, really, really smart. This is a great paper, it's in your handout, um, and I would highly recommend if you're interested in this topic to read it because it goes through this algorithm. And the main point I want you to look at here is let's say you do the CT, you do the LP, or you don't, and it's negative. Diagnostic stop. So. Most of us, me included in training, if they had a thunderclap headache, I ruled out subarachnoid and they go home. But what else could it be, right? Thunderclap headache is no bueno, it's not normal. So I want you to remember these two other things. Thunderclap headache, use your own brain and think, what else could it be? It could be a migraine, it could be a tension, but it could be this thing, RCVS, okay? Reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. It is a lot to say, but let's just break it down. Reversible, that's good. It tends to be self-limited. It goes away on its own, typically over a matter of weeks. Cerebral, it's in the brain. Vasoconstriction, so what's actually happening here is that the arteries in the brain are squeezing and vasoconstricting, and it's recurrent, okay? It's very strange, but this is out there. This is out there. And you've probably all seen this at one point. So it's reversible, which is good. The vessels are spasming, and it causes recurrent thunderclap headaches. That is the hallmark of this diagnosis. They have a thunderclap headache, and then it recurs, and usually they last one to five hours. And it's terrible. It's debilitating. I've seen this three times, and the people were just beside themselves. The reason that I want you guys to know about it is that it can be associated with bleeding and stroke. Um, most of the time not, but it can. So these people, if you do make this diagnosis, should get admitted, generally to neurology. Most of the time it's triggered by something. In the three cases I saw, one was drugs, cocaine. So cocaine and methamphetamine are the most um, associated with this. Why? Vasoconstriction, right? It's causing the vessels to constrict. Um, postpartum, I've seen one patient of postpartum RCVS, and again, terrible headaches, recurrent. Okay, and then sexual activity. I saw a patient who had a terrible um, headache with intercourse and it went away and then came back a couple hours later. We treated them just like you were mentioning. We did the CT, the CT within six hours was negative. We treated them with meds, the guy got better. And then about six hours later, he came back. So recurrent thunderclap headaches, think about this diagnosis. It can cause bleeding and the way to diagnose it, you guys, it's, remember, vasoconstriction. So you gotta do some kind of A, some kind of arteriography. The recommended is a CTA, okay? CT angiography of the head and neck. Most of us have access to these. 
and you're going to look at the vessels, and they should see the vessels getting spastic at certain points. Radiologists are going to tell you if this is present, but a CTA actually is really good for this diagnosis, as is an MRA. Okay? So RCVS, recurrent thunderclap headaches, CTA or MRA. Okay? The treatment is really going to be pain control, and most of these people, yeah, question. Good question. So does it, the question was, does it only show when they're having the headache? Um, in the case that I saw, yes, but I've heard and I've talked to radiologists, not always. Sometimes you can still see the vasospasm when they're not having the headache. So still worth a try to do the CTA. Great question, though. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was about a formal angiogram, right, where they go in and get the catheter and have the formal angio. Yes, absolutely, and that's probably the gold standard. It's just much more laborative to get a, a regular angiogram. So because CT angiogram is much more available, probably would start with that, but you're absolutely right. You definitely can see it on the regular formal angiogram. So if they're using drugs, you want to stop them. Calcium channel blockers can help um, with the vasospasm. So again, um, nicardipine would be a good medication to use if they're having severe issues with blood pressure control. So the take home, a rare headache syndrome, RCVS, recurrent thunderclap headaches. Do a CT angiogram, and usually it's going to be something that's triggered, okay? Just think about it. It's about the same incidence as subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm. Cool. All right. One last thing, guys. This is something most of us know about, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. All you got to remember here, it's a DVT of the brain, okay? It is a thrombosed vein in the venous system here, so generally it's going to be the superior sagittal sinus or the cortical veins. And this is a great paper to read, but the bottom line is that women are more common, but everyone in this sample had a risk factor for hypercoagulability. So if you have headache plus hypercoagulable state, most of them were OCPs, okay? But pregnant, cancer, surgery recently, all of those risk factors that you guys know about can be a risk factor for this, all right? Most people also had an abnormal neuro exam. So the physical exam here is super important. And in this series, actually it was papilledema, which I know is really hard. I don't do papilledema on every headache, but if you have a panoptic scope, that does help you. Um, but visual field cuts, I actually do this on all my headaches now. Visual field cut, was associated um, with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So do a good neuro exam on your headache patients. And then again, because this is a DVT of the brain, you gotta do something in the V. The gold standard is gonna be an MRV. Now, not all of us have that, but you can do a CTV, a CT venous phase. And talk to your radiologist, it's the same as a CTA angio, they just do it in a different phase. So that's what you're gonna do. And then you oftentimes can see it on a regular CT, but don't hang your hat on that. You have to do some kind of V. E. This is what you might see on your board exams, a triangle sign down here, guys. So that is an acute venous thrombosis in the superior sagittal sinus. The cord sign is over here. So you see acute bright white blood in the cortical sinus. And then this is an example of a CT venogram. Okay, this is a CTV. And you'll see here, superior sagittal sinus. See how it's not filling up with blood? So there's that thrombus there. So that's how the CTV really helps you. You, don't, you see actually the thrombus. Here is an example of a normal CTV with normal filling of that sinus. Okay? So the treatment, it's a DVT. It's a deep venous thrombosis in the brain, so you're going to give them heparin. Um, the controversy comes up where... Some of these people actually bleed because of this thrombosis in the brain, but there's a Cochrane review that looked at this, and it still is safer to do the heparin. And you're going to admit these people to neurology. So the take-home with a CVST is if you have someone with an he acute headache, hypercoagulable state, and OCPs was common there, and cancer and pregnancy, plus neurological symptoms. Most of these people had abnormal physical exam. MRV is the gold standard. You can also do CTV, and your treatment is heparin. And here is our takeaway. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT within six hours, you're good. After six hours, you still got to do the LP. Consider CTA if you're looking for aneurysms. RCVS is recurrent thunderclap headaches. And then CVST 
is a DBT of the brain. Thanks so much for your questions, you guys, and we will move on.